My name's Millicent Rowan. Hi, I'm Master John Drake. And I just wanted to have a conversation about taking the line and what it means to me, some stuff I've learned and unlearned over the years, um, both through being taught it and also teaching other people. And I mainly mean taking the line with the sword. So what many of us are typically taught where you're making sure you're strong is against their weak, you know, you're you're dominating the last six inches or so of their blade. It's it's kind of the uh, the standard thing we're all taught when we first start fencing in the SCA. And uh, I've always had a hard time learning it. And then I've kind of started to move away from it more and more as far as very standard way of teaching it. So I don't really tell students to take the line anymore. I don't tell them to extend their blade out and put it on top of their opponent's blade. Um, not in a normal way anymore. Uh, not in how I was taught. Uh, but, like, I, I may have been considering moving away from using the word taking the line from my vocabulary at all. And uh, John has a different way of doing it now um, that I've been enjoying. But if yeah, you want... um, I... I, uh, I am not sure that I think we should take away the term taking the line, mm -hmm. but I do think that, one, taking the line with the sword and striking in a single time is taught as a very basic, simple concept in fencing, and it is actually one of the most difficult things to do. Yeah. Uh, with I said, like, having the line with the sword and striking in a single tempo. That is uh, very, very hard, actually. Yeah. Um, but it is taught as it's taught like it's a basic idea, and it is it is sort of it is simple in some ways, but it is it is very difficult to do. It may be a simple um, concept, but the the angles to make it actually execute and the timing in which you do it is yes brutal. And so so specifically specifically the single time is is really the hard one of the hard part, right? Because usually people can parry with their sword, and then you can throw it attack back, but it's usually two times, right? Like you've parried mm -hmm. and then reposted, and striking in the single time is the hard part. Um, so in general, like always in fencing, you want to make sure that you don't, you weren't struck. So, mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other thing that I have kind of adjusted my thinking of is I think about uh, just sort of clogging the lane up. So generally, if I'm going to attack someone, I like to, I like to most of the time attack them on their sword side because it keeps my sword kind of between me and them. And it's, and it's not exactly the traditional way of controlling the line. But it makes me really easy from my attack to then turn my sword into a parry because my sword is already right there by their sword. So even if it doesn't have them blocked out all the way to begin with, it's really easy to adjust my defense to keep my body behind my hand. Mm -hmm. And you did show me that. Like, I'm I'm John's student, right? So he's taught me for years and years. <laughs> and I've always struggled with this particular concept because the way I thought about it was very sword isolated and like it, it always made it two tempos and when I tried to teach it how I kind of was classically taught um, people tend to like move their sword too far left and right instead of driving forward and John had talked about kind of driving forward and I had interpreted it as punching the hilt forward into your opponent's blade so you're sort of um, locking up their blade more instead of just this gentle <laughs> left and right you know I don't know even how to describe it, uh, how I was traditionally taught. <laughs> so when he talked about clogging the lane, that made a lot more sense to me. And then he talked about keeping your hands in front of you and keeping yourself behind your hands, uh, sort of like boxing. And that conceptually worked for, very well for me. Uh, just doesn't feel like the same flavor as how yeah. I usually see people teach it. Teach it. The, other, uh, the other thing that I think uh, both Rowan and I think and teach a lot is that uh, so this is so a lot of times the discussion of controlling the line or taking the line is talked about doing it with the sword, and I think that's very difficult. I think it is actually pretty easy and simple to take the line with the dagger. Yeah, that's true. Um, and you can take the line with the dagger and strike in a single tempo, and that's actually pretty easy to do. Well, it is easier to do, and I think that uh, that is something that we spend a lot of time because uh, we obviously all like sword and dagger uh, are are kind of. Most people like Sword and Dagger better, and we specifically like Sword and Dagger way better. Um, and so we spend a lot of time working on that and teaching our students that. Um, and so I think we're pretty good at that. And I think if you look at some of the best, a lot of the best fencers 
uh, in the SCA or just in, and in HEMA too, they're usually really good at taking the line with their dagger and striking it a single time. Um, and I think that's actually much, it's much simpler, it's much more easy to do. Um, yeah. And it's and it has a lot of advantages because once you have one hand to control the sword and one hand to attack, mm -hmm. then you give up, you have a lot more creativity in, in within that. You have so many more options, right? Like, if yeah. my dagger is bound up your blade, then I have all the options in the world to strike with my sword. If my, I've tried to use my sword to bind your blade, I have to worry about you slipping my sword. I have to worry about driving in in a particular way where I'm still protected and I'm taking the shortest line. It is just... Mentally and, and physically uh, is so hard. <laughs> yeah, and I think you can also, as you're controlling the sword with your uh, dagger, with your opponent's sword with your dagger, you can keep your sword in a position... To continue to clog the lane up, mm, so you can true. still target their sword side, their their sword side, like the side of their body or their front yeah. hip. That's um, a good point. And that, if they do get off of your dagger, then your sword can just easily pick the sword up, right, uh, and, and adjust from that. We have talked about that before, where like you'll watch uh, fighters, especially when they're kind of coming out of a of a pass, the really good ones um, sort of build a wall with both their hands. Like all of this is just using both your hands efficiently with to, with each other but if you bind with a dagger your sword is like is right there to protect you too it's not like one just kind of goes away it's not one or the other it's both together um not necessarily taking up the same line because you're, then you're clogging the same lane instead of clogging multiple lanes or Correct. if you didn't say lines be like you know taking multiple lines or stringering multiple lines uh you're not putting all your eggs in one basket um I do like that a lot, <laughs> as far as, even if you did use your sword as the dominant way of defending yourself, the offhand, whether it's a dagger or buckler or whatever, still has to be there for when your opponent slips your sword, because it's not really an if, it's more of a win. Um, yeah, so your hands really need to work together and in tandem. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the last, uh, one of the last videos Rowan and I made about uh, why we like to fight with the refused guard and stuff, uh, the, really, the main point is that you need to use your dagger and your sword together. Even if your sword is more forward, the dagger still needs to be a big part of the system. Right. And we think that that's easier to do from a, from a refused guard in a, in a squared up stance. Yeah. Um, and, and that leads to the best outcomes in our fight, is because if you keep your shoulders and hips square, you can use both hands well. Yeah. Uh, but you can still take the line with either, or the lane or whatever, with either hand... Uh, versus people who are more profiled have a harder time doing it with their offhand. Right. I mean, it makes and sense. You can do like, it with either hand. If you're if you're super profiled, your offhand just isn't available anymore. It's it's <laughs> it's kind of taken out of the fight. So you're only relying on your one sword, your one hand. Yeah. Which makes you kind of stuck. Um, and we we have a bunch of videos planned to go into all of these topics in much more detail. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, from different angles and stuff. So. So I think we're excited to keep to keep up this discussion, but mm -hmm. definitely. And I, I personally find that um, drilling in a simple dagger parry, or, or I guess you could say taking the line with the dagger and the hitting with the sword, drilling that for me transfers to real fights much easier than. The classic drill of taking the line and driving in because I've found that when I do the taking the line with just the sword and drive in, in a real fight, too many variables come on and then it, the drill is not relevant to reality anymore. It yeah. just, it's if it's in a vacuum, it works beautifully with somebody fighting against somebody who also fights just like you. Uh, and then when I try to take it outside of that perfect sterile environment, it just it hurts my wrist. It makes me angry. Like, it's just it's so frustrating. And I've had students say the same. I've had students say like, wow, I was trolled, sword forward, take the line with a sword, drive in, or not even drive in. It's really just like, extend. Like they say, take the line, extend. And it's, a lot of people struggle with strength and not being strong enough to do it. Or uh, if you just are like a quarter inch off, it doesn't work. Um, I don't know. It's caused a lot of aggravation in me. It's caused a lot of aggravation in a lot of my students. Uh, and then when I simplified it and told them to sort pull their sword back and use their hands together 
to protect themselves, they suddenly were a lot more successful. And they, um, it seemed to just make a little bit more sense, because it wasn't as mysterious anymore. It was simplified. I think, and I think everyone, you know, has had the stupid, like, arm wrestling competition, right, where you're trying <laughs> to, like, and it's just, like, it's, it's like I said, oh it's God. much trickier to get to work practically, uh, like, in drilling and in, in, in demonstrations, it, it seems easy, and every now and then it lines up, and you do it, and it works perfect, but mm -hmm. it's so much easier to get someone uh, to learn to do a dagger parry throw and oh, attack okay. yeah. in a single time. Uh, and I think that you can get someone, like, I can get someone to do that, and if they can do that decently well, then they can go, like, win a lot of tournaments, like, yeah. really fast. Like It's, it's really successful. A really good way to get people to learn and, and have a lot of success quickly, and there's a lot of nuance and other things that go into it, footwork and range and timing and everything, but the simple action of dagger parry attack uh, is, is so good, um, and it scales well. Mm -hmm. You just learn how to get it to work better and better. Yeah, and it scales super well into the high level. Like it's still the techniques I it's still the same basic techniques I use now to win high level tournaments right. that I did when I was winning, you know, novice and uh, cadet tourneys and stuff when I was coming up. Yeah, so. it's just more cleaned up. It's just better than it was before, but it's the same concept. Um. So like, mm -hmm. so I really think, um, uh, I really think that yeah, teaching people, uh, the some basic dagger parries, and being able to teach them to parry and attack in the same in a single time so they're not it's not parry attack mm -hmm. works really well and gets people to to have a lot of success very quickly yeah i i definitely like it um and uh i think that the the way we teach taking the line with sword could also be updated i, I like the idea of clogging the lane i like the idea of kind of keeping behind your hands but i don't like having people hyper drill placement of the sword and driving in because I don't think it scales long term but I do think that the idea of make sure you're addressing your opponent's sword you don't want to just step in and get hit of course but you do want to address it we should work we should work more I think to teach people to drive their hand forward um, get behind their hands you use their feet to protect themselves rather than obsessing with hand goes to like first and protects you and <laughs> Yeah. I just, I, as a student, I could never really get it to work well, um, and it, it caused me a lot of anger because it was so many people said to do it, and it just didn't seem to work. And then as a teacher, I don't like it because I don't like watching my students fail. Um, it just, it makes them sad. It makes me sad. <laughs> so. Yeah, I really, uh, I really agree with Rowan that the idea that you need to teach someone to address the sword in their attack when they are attacking or defending is a better way to think of it because I let's say I did a big fake like I stuttered someone and they make a big sword parry and their sword is completely out of position I am now safe to attack them mm -hmm. I don't have the line no but I'm completely safe I've dealt their sword is not a threat to me for a moment so I'm I have a free move I have a free attack on them yeah so that's just as good as controlling the line with mechanical advantage or whatever right or having a dagger parry or a sword parry on it yeah. So there's a lot of ways you can have dealt with your opponent's sword as you're attacking them. It doesn't need to necessarily be that you physically are controlling their weapon with your with your sword. Like even there, actually, so we have, a, I know some people might be listening to this more of a podcast, but John does dominate my, my sword with his sword, because we're single sword here. But then as, like this is not a terribly standard way of doing it. You know, he's driving his hilt into me. And then once he feels safe, he can come up. But I've I was fully dealt with <laughs> in this situation. Yeah, like I was screwed. Well, that yeah. I mean, if we want to, if we want to talk about the video, if you want to play that background, actually, mm -hmm. if you want to, if we want to delve, in, delve into this specific yeah, sure. technique, because this is actually how I like to fight single sword a lot now. So we play it. Go slow. Yeah. I don't remember the hotkeys for going slow. Half speed, okay, or you want quarter speed? That's half is fine. Um, so, right, stop there, there. Well, back a little bit. <laughs> stop it there. So, in this position, 
and this, in, and this, in my opinion, is actually the most important part to um, to controlling the line with the sword a and the dagger. Actually, is uh, what some people call pressing into the point. Mm -hmm. So my tip is really high. It is not. If you drew a, if you drew a line from the pommel of my sword through the tip, it would be pointed past Rowan's head, right? Right to the sky. Yeah, but that's fine because they've built a wall between my with my sword that she is stuck on. And if mm -hmm. she pushes her hand forward into me, it just drives her blade into my hand. Right. The strongest part of my weapon, right? So I have complete control over her sword here. And building a ramp with your sword, and it's also how you do it with a dagger too, mm -hmm. building a ramp with your blades into your so that they slide into your hand, which is the strongest part. This is how you do it. You don't necessarily, and you don't need to have, so you don't need to have your point necessarily pointed at your opponent. I'm pointed past her head or shoulder, right? Mm -hmm. But I built a huge wall. Um, so I've kind of, I, to a certain extent, I'm also counting on this being a two-tempo attack, right? I've defended her weapon, then I'm going to step in and then strike her secondly. Right. Uh, and I just find this to be better. So also, if you play it forward a little bit slowly here, yeah. So Rowan does, Rowan's sword ends up in my guard here. Yep. And then I think she ends up doing a kind of a, trying to do a big disengage here. Yeah. Uh, no, she's still controlled. Yeah. Like, it's a... The only way for that disengage to have worked on my end is for me to really back yeah. out fast. And I try to and lift now, my hilt. And now, if you look... Yeah, mm -hmm. now her sword is being pulled into a position where it's... Where it really can't attack or th defend. No. And so I don't necessarily need to have physical control of it anymore. No. And there's a moment here where it's a little bit... I think that it's this is past me here. It's hard yeah. to tell in this angle. It's hard, yeah, her, three she's dimensional. not throwing a shot. She's yeah. trying to do like this weird parry thing. Right. And now her sword is past me, so I don't need to physically control it. So yeah. I it is, my sword is now hand. irrelevant. Yeah. It's on the outside, um, on John's right. Mm -hmm. So, who cares? <laughs> He's totally safe. Mm -hmm. And I plan, um, I plan to make some videos uh, discussing specifically and going going through uh, the mechanics of that sword parry. Mm hmm and the mechanics of the dagger parry and how to and how that works uh, in in greater detail um, than this. But right, yeah, this is not about how to do single sword good. This is more like my own pet peeve of I keep you know talking to students or I keep getting information from people and they everybody uses the word taking the line. Everybody uses the word like sword should go first, and I've just gotten so disillusioned over the time um, to the point where I was just like I'm not gonna do it. Like I bought this skinny elite blade because I just hate people touching my sword so I learned to try to disengage and get out of there and just use my dagger instead um, and I need to actually for my game do more of what John does where I'm actually driving my hilt into my opponent's blade and clogging the lane and and dominating yeah a bit better but it took a lot of arm uh, strength I, think I do agree Rowan does need to work a little bit on blade <laughs> mechanics because you don't even have you can have a light blade and still yeah have good sword parries absolutely but um, i had just, just like, given up <laughs> so i was so upset yeah but you can also have a lot of success with just defending yourself with your range with your range like with your uh, with your footwork and your dagger mm -hmm. yeah. really that's honestly that that may be that's probably 80 or 90 percent of what you need to be successful the blade mechanics uh for sword and dagger fighting which is the majority of what we do because most tournaments allow you to bring whatever bring an offhand if you want to right mm-hmm so the majority of what we're of what we're fighting, we're fighting sword and dagger or sword and buckler or whatever. But sword and dagger is the most common style. You know what? Really having a having good dagger, mm -hmm. a good dagger parry, good dagger parries, and good footwork and good timing, <laughs> that will that's probably as much as you really need. And the I... blade mechanics of your the your main blade mechanics, your sword mechanics, uh, for defense, is probably the least important part. Mostly, you just need to use know how to do it offensively, throwing and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and there's only. 20% of the time or so that you need to use the sword to defend. I think so. I, I would even extend it, honestly, because I'm grumpy. I would extend it to single sword to a certain degree of, like, most of your defense is coming from timing and distance and your feet, and just relying on your sword to do everything for you is not true. It's just <laughs> it's way too hard yeah. to get that to work. Especially for a new person who doesn't yeah, have I mean... feet that can defend them. Like, a baby new person can't... They can, they're still learning how to lunge forward and backwards and protect themselves. They're learning how to read a fight and demanding that they always, you know, stringer their opponent's blade is, it's too much. It's too much to do all at once. 
I want them to get get good feet first, use their dagger to defend them, and then I can start adding that other stuff in. Um, but honestly, I've been fighting for 10 years, I've been pretty dang successful, and I don't prefer to use taking the line in a standard way. Personally. Yes, I agree. <laughs> and if you look at a lot of the successful fencers in the FCA and in HEMA, they're mostly using offhand and footwork. Even if they say they're using blade, they're they're using sword, uh, sword parries and stuff. It's not majority of the time. And you have to look at the actual videos, <laughs> not what they say. Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate everyone listening to our <laughs> TED talk and <laughs> listening to me complain about blade mechanics. Um, I'm really excited about John's upcoming videos. Uh, if you want to check out more of his stuff, his channel is called The, Mi the Medieval Media on YouTube. Uh, I highly recommend subscribing. He's got a lot of really good stuff on there. Um, my channel, Mil Millicent Rowan, is going to have more tutorial videos as well as I might do more of these discussion type videos. Um, please reach out to both of us either through YouTube or social media, Discord, Facebook. I'm happy to answer any questions. We're we're here to help. Uh, fencing is something we both Definitely. enjoy talking about and enjoy training people as well as training ourselves. So I want to hear from you. Do you have anything to add, John? Definitely. <laughs> I don't pretty much wraps it up. Awesome. Thank you all for your time. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye, guys.